Good morning. Well, today, by God's grace, we come to the final verse of the disciples' prayer, or as many of you know it, the Lord's Prayer. We've been in this, these uh, few verses here from 9 to 13 for the last five weeks, and my wife, who's at home right now uh, with our sick baby, um, she said, well, why don't you just slow down a little bit? Because uh, it's, it's been five weeks in these verses. Um, Really, though, uh, she's right. We, we could take so much longer to get through the Lord's Prayer. There's so much here. It's so deep. And today we come to our need to be delivered from evil. Matthew 6.13 says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. We have a need. It is a great need to be delivered from evil, to be delivered from the devil and his power over us. I'm so grateful that God is stronger than both our flesh and the devil, aren't you? He's stronger than anything. Man is so weak compared to our adversary, but Jesus has the victory. And no matter what kind of grip the prince of darkness might have you in right now, no matter how long you have been in his grip, you may be chained up in his castle even, but Jesus came to set the captives free. He did. And may God help us to pray this prayer with full confidence that Jesus is the Almighty God and that the battle has already been won by Him at the cross and the empty grave. If you are a Christian, the Spirit of Christ lives within you and you can share in His triumph. And so now, as we pray, Lord, deliver us from the evil one. Let's submit our hearts to God. Let's truly, from our hearts, ask the Lord to answer this prayer in each one of our lives. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our sins so easily entangle us and we are tempted uh, by so many different things and Satan is so crafty. And we fall into his trap often, Lord. But we need your victory. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, Lord. Give us victory, over our sin. Lord, bless us now as we come to this final verse in the prayer that is so famous. I pray that uh, we would now look at this prayer in a new light and that when we say it, when we recite this prayer, it would have real meaning to us. That it wouldn't just be something that we say from rote memory or some kind of a mantra, but that we would know that you truly are our loving Father who is holy, who is in heaven. Oh Lord, because of that, we know that you will hear our prayers, that you are with us now. I pray that the Holy Spirit may come and enlighten our minds and give us power to overcome uh, sins that have even uh, entrapped us and entangled us. I pray for this church, Lord. Give us victory. Make this a victorious body of believers. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you'd open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, we'll read out loud verses 9 to 13 one more time. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Today we're going to focus on verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why does Jesus tell us to pray that our Father may not lead us into temptation? After all, James 1.13 says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Indeed, God is not the one who tempts us. In Matthew chapter 4, we see who the tempter is. If you just turn back, Matthew chapter 4, verses uh, 2 and 3, It says, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. 
And then verse 10, uh, it reveals who the tempter is in Matthew 4, verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So Satan is the tempter. Satan is real. We live in a time where Satan is portrayed in Hollywood, and even there's some ridiculous, horrible uh, television show called Lucifer that's on t TV right now. Have you seen this show? Or at least have you seen maybe an advertisement for it? Where it shows some man who's supposed to be the devil who's trying to reform his ways and oh my goodness. Really, really terrible, okay? And, and so it, it, Hollywood and the culture portrays the devil as, as either like, ah, eh, not so bad of a guy. He's trying to reform, all right? And he, or either that or like some person in a red costume with a tail and horns and he's, you know, sitting on your shoulder whispering things to you and he's just kind of mischievous. He's not really evil. And, you know, the irony of all that is that that's the devil's work doing that, all right? That's the devil's work to try to convince you that he's really not so bad if he exists at all. Someone once said the devil's greatest power is, is, the devil's greatest trick is convincing the world that he didn't exist. And I, I think that that's, that's probably true because if you don't know, if you don't believe that they, we really do have a tempter, we really do have an adversary who hates us, who wants to kill us, who lo would love nothing better than to see every single person here burning in hell. That's what he wants for everyone. And... You know, if we don't believe that there's a person like that, who's a spirit, who's created spirit, but very, very powerful spirit, who was created sometime in Genesis, because in Genesis 3, we see the serpent in the garden, right, tempting Adam and Eve. Um, and really, if we see in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus identifies who the tempter is, well, then we know who the serpent is in Genesis 3. It's the devil. It's the devil. If we know that, well, then we can equip ourselves to fight against him. In verse 10, Jesus reveals that the identity of his tempter is Satan. The devil is real. So then why does Jesus tell us pray, to pray that our Father may not lead us into temptation? I think Martin Lloyd-Jones is helpful here. He says, we are asking that we should never be led into a situation where we are liable to be tempted by Satan. It means that we should request God to preserve us from this. Hebrews 12:1 sin so easily entangles us. It's so easy because we're predisposed to it. And in a sense, when I pray, lead me not into temptation, I'm actually saying, Lord, lead me into righteousness. That's what I'm saying in this prayer. That's what this prayer means. Lead me not into temptation is the negative. Lead me into righteousness. Deliver me from evil. That's the positive. And really, the only one who can honestly pray this prayer is the regenerated person whose father is God. That's the only person who can honestly say, lead me not into temptation. Because why? The sinner does not desire to be delivered from his temptations. Before I knew Jesus Christ, I never desired to be delivered from my temptations. If I could pray anything at all, I might pray this, Lord, deliver me from the consequences of my temptations, from the consequences of my sins, right? That's all that the natural man can honestly pray because he loves his sin. He wants his sin. He wants to hold it. He doesn't hate it. But we don't like the consequences of our sins. We like illicit sexuality, but we don't like STDs that go along with it, right? In Thomas Boston's book, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State, the, the book that uh, we're reading in book club right now, it's sort of a difficult book, but so rich and deep. Boston says this, It is only the saints who groan under the burden of our sins. Here the Apostle Paul in 
Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? But thanks be to Christ, uh, uh, to, to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the carnal man, the natural man, the one who doesn't believe in the Lord, the one who's not a Christian, lives in ease and quiet regarding his sin. Is it because he has no burden? No. He lives in ease and quiet regarding his sin because he does not feel his burden. It's not because the natural man doesn't have a burden of sin. Every single one of us had a burden of sin at one point unless Jesus Christ took it away from us at the cross. We had this tremendous burden. We were like the Chilean miners buried underneath the earth, underneath this mountain of debt to God, which we learned about last week. But the natural man doesn't feel that weight. Why? Because dead people don't feel anything. That's the reason why. Because Paul says that at one time we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Many groans are heard from a sick bed. When a, a person is sick and they're laying in bed, you can hear them moaning and groaning, oh, this is terrible, I hate this. They might even post on the Facebook, I feel miserable. Ugh. And they're on their sick bed. But you never see a Facebook post from a person in the grave, do you? Or you never hear a groan from the person in the grave. Because people in sick beds groan, but people in the grave are silent. And the saint, as in the sick man, there's a mighty struggle against our sin, a life and death striving for mastery over our sin and over our flesh and over the devil. But in the natural man, as in the dead corpse, there is no noise because death bears full sway. When we pray to the Lord, lead me not into temptation. Lead me instead into righteousness. Do we really mean it? Just think about it. Just think about it for a second. Do we really mean it? If we're struggling with whatever sin, if it's, say, a sexual sin, if we're struggling with that, right? Do we play around the edges Say, this far but no further. Do we really want to be delivered from our temptations? Do we really want to not be led into, into temptation? Or to us is temptation sort of fun? And we like it. And we give in to it. And we give in to it because we love it. This prayer really only makes sense for those whose Father is God. When we say, Our Father who is in heaven, Your name is holy. When we say that, what are we saying? That, that we have a Father who is also a King over us. We have a Father who is also our Lord. And if He is our Lord, that means that we need to obey what He says. If He is holy, that means that He expects holiness from His children. We are His offspring. And so He wants His offspring to live a holy life. What does Jesus say? A bad tree cannot bear good fruit, and a good tree does not bear bad fruit. Well, God is the good tree, and we are now His offspring. We are the, the fruit. We are fruit that God has picked, that He's redeemed. He's brought into His kingdom. And so, do we really act like it? Is that really what we are? Are we really the children of God? If so, then we can... You know what I'm talking about. You know this struggle then. This struggle of like, I'm tempted... On all sides, I, I'm, I feel tempted by all these different things. But Lord, I hate it. I don't want it. I'll tell you something that happened yesterday. Yesterday I went to, um, I went to a wedding in Chicago. It was, it was a 
crazy things were happening yesterday. I, I met a homeless man named Iron Man. At least that's what he said his name was. And uh, <laughs> uh, I shared the gospel with Iron Man. And then uh, and I was at this wedding, and so I was wearing a suit, you know. And uh, Amy had me park the car. I dropped her off. I parked the car. We were over by State Street downtown in Chicago. And, uh, and as I was walking back to the wedding, to where the reception was, these two guys came up next to me, and we were standing sort of at the crosswalk about to wait for the, the walk sign so we could grow, walk across the street. And they came up to me, and they, they said, Hey, man, I, I like your suit. And I was like, Thank you. And, and, then, oh, and, and then they said, then they said um, You want to buy some marijuana? Now, some of you know my past and my history, and, um, you know, I, I used to smoke marijuana like every day of my life from the age of 12 until I was 22. So for 10 years, um, I was, I mean, people say, oh, marijuana is not ad addictive. I disagree with that statement. I disagree. I was absolutely addicted to it. And people say, oh, it's not a, a gateway drug. I also disagree with that as well because uh, it led me into all kinds of different drugs. And um, I, I really feel like, uh, like I would be a much smarter man today. I, I, I think it, it, it killed so many of my brain cells. Um, I would be much smarter uh, than I am had I not done that. I, I can't even remember any of my teachers' names in high school or college at all. I can't remember that that time in my life um, is a blur, a complete blur. It's ba basically blanked out from the time of like 12 until I met the Lord at 22 is gone for me. It's gone. And... Um, and when those guys came up to me, as I'm standing there, you know, it's not very often that, like, Pastor Dave is approached by somebody like, hey, you want to buy some bud, man? Like, <laughs> that doesn't happen to me. Not anymore, anyway, you know. Not, not very often. Um, and, uh, and I said no. <laughs> I said no, all right. Um, <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, and, and I wouldn't. The Lord, the Lord has, has delivered me from that. He delivered me from that temptation years ago. All right? But as I was walking then, they were like, all right, whatever, and they, they left. And as I kept walking, I was thinking how easy it could have been for me to say yes to that. And uh, no one would have known. And, uh, you know, uh, I had, uh, my wife gave me money that day, <laughs> you know. <laughs> she gave me an allowance. Uh, I, had, I had $20 in my pocket. And, like, I, 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 I could have, except God would have known, though. God would have known. And God forbid that I would be a pastor in God's church and do something so wicked. No, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't. But I realized that it's only the grace of God who delivered me from that temptation. Even in that moment, He delivered me from it. Even in that moment. And I thanked God. I, I was walking for blocks and blocks, and I thanked the Lord after that, and I said, thank you. Thank you for delivering me. This is exactly what I'm going to preach tomorrow. I, Lord, uh, what kind of a man would I be if you hadn't delivered me from my temptation and my sin? I'd be utterly sold into sin, utterly wicked. Now, God may allow us still to be tempted from the devil. He may allow temptation to occur in one's life for his ultimate purpose of testing the quality of a person's character. I mean, we see that with Joseph in the book of Genesis. We see that. Um, 
with Potiphar's wife, they're alone. All right? They're not going to get caught. They're alone. And she says, come, lay with me, sleep with me. He says, how can I do this evil thing and sin against God? See, because even though they're alone, Joseph knows they're not really alone. Even though I was alone on the street in Chicago last night, and my wife wasn't there, and my church members weren't there, I'm not alone. God is watching. God is with me. Jesus says, surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. He is with me always. We sang a song, when we gather, he's here. Amen. When we're alone, he's here too. He's always here. He's with us. He's with us when people want to harm us. He's with us when we feel lonely. We still have Jesus. We're really never alone. But He's also there with us when we're tempted. And if we sin, He's there too. We need to keep that in, the, in our minds. Because the, the, you know, the real, like, real reality is that we don't really believe that. All right? We really don't. I mean, in the moment right now, as pastors in the pulpit saying, he's always with us, we say, amen. And we believe it right now. I, I, I believe that you believe it in this moment. At least some of you do. All right? But then we leave and we forget and then we, we stop believing that. We don't really believe that he's actually there all the time. That, well, I can prove it to you. If the Lord Jesus in the flesh came down out of heaven and was standing in your living room, would you talk to your spouse the way that you talk to them with him standing there? If the Lord Jesus was physically standing in your bedroom next to your computer. He's standing there and he wants to talk with you. Would you still click on that website then? Would you do it then? No way. No way. If the Lord Jesus was standing here in the sanctuary right now in the flesh, oh man, would you be thinking even what some of you might be thinking at this moment? The reality is that if we really believe that Jesus was with us always, even to the very end of the age, then our lives would look different than they do sometimes. Amen? Amen to that. If we really do believe that, then uh, things would be different, I, I think, for us. And we need to have, uh, um, I mean, a real constant reminder of the reality of that because He is with us the same right now as he would be if he was here standing here in the flesh. He is with us the same. The same. The same. Say the same. The same. It's the same thing. We just don't really believe it. But if we don't believe it, that means that we don't believe what Jesus says. Joseph wouldn't sin with Potiphar's wife because he knew that God was there. Even you think about David in the cave with Saul. You remember Saul was trying to murder him. He hated him and he tried to pin him to the wall with a spear even. But David refused to lift his hand against God's anointed. He refused to do it because he recognized that Saul, even though Saul is acting completely wickedly, he's still God's anointed man, king over Israel. He's still that. All right, and so David is in a cave, a dark cave. They don't have flashlights back then, okay? He's in this dark cave, and who walks into the cave alone to go to the bathroom 
but the very man who's been trying to kill David. And he's just there, just sitting there in the cave, back turned. And David's friends say, See, the Lord has delivered him into your hands. Go cut his head off. Oh, can you imagine the temptation that David had in that moment? To go and strike Saul and kill Saul? He had so much temptation to do that. So much. And instead he cuts off a little fragment of his garment. Why? Why did he do that? Why didn't he just take that sword and thrust it through his enemy? Because he knows the same Lord that we know who says, love your enemies. And forgive those who have harmed you. And when Saul goes out of the cave, when he's far enough away, David says, you see this piece of garment? I could have done it, but I didn't. Why? Why? Because David knew that God was there in that moment, that he was with him, that he's in the cave with him right then, and he wasn't going to sin like that. He wasn't going to strike the Lord's anointed. Is there any sin in your life right now? Any temptation that just seems altogether too difficult to overcome? Even impossible? You know, I have to say something because our culture teaches this and says that, um, that homosexuality is inalterable. That a person is born that way and they can never change and you can never change your orientation and you're stuck. You're stuck just like that forever. How hopeless that is. How hopeless of a message that is for a Christian who really struggles against the temptation of same-sex attraction when they have this whole culture that says to them, you can never change. Never, never. You're stuck like that forever. I refuse to believe that. God is the one who changes our desires. He changes our hearts. I used to have illicit desire. I used to have wicked desires. I used to have desire to be high every day. And God changed my heart. He's in the business of changing hearts. Amen! Praise the Lord! And when people say something like, well, they're born as a homosexual, you know what? I don't even argue against that. Because, sure, sure they can be born that way. Of course, we're all born sinners. I have a friend whose father was an alcoholic. He got six DUIs by the time I was 16 with my buddy. His father couldn't drive anymore. And my friend was given, he had an inward, natural desire for alcohol. I mean, so strong, it's a desire that I never had, but he was born with it. It was in his, his genes, DNA, he's born with it, because his, his father, it's sort of a, a generational sin coming down to my friend. He's born with it. But just because you're born with it doesn't mean it's all right. Just because he's born as a, he was born an alcoholic. Doesn't mean like, well, I was born that way, therefore give me as much beer as I can drink. I know, no one would say, that, right, yes, he was born that way, it's okay then. No. But God is in the business of changing hearts. There is no sinful desire that God can't change. None. He absolutely can. He can absolutely deliver you from your temptations. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 13, it says, God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And then in Hebrews it says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Okay then. So if he provides a way of escape, and we've not yet resisted to the point of shedding our blood, then none of us can ever say, oh the Lord, the temptation is just too strong. I have to give in. I have no other option but to give in. I was made this way. I'm, it's my natural inclination. It's how I have to go. I have to make this choice. No, you do not. He will provide a way of escape in every single circumstance in which you're tempted. 
He provides a way of escape. For me last night, the way of escape was, no thank you, I'm going to walk away from you right now. He did not, those guys did not trap me in a room and force a joint in my mouth. No, he provided a way of escape. I have a friend who was addicted to cocaine. That's a very strong drug. And the Lord changed him. He saved him. He brought him into his kingdom. This guy is just a lovely, lovely man of God. I love him very, very much. And, um, and this brother, uh, he got saved, um, I think maybe like a year before I did. And he, he just he walked with me and helped me as I was just trying to figure out who God is. And anyway, so this guy was a, 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 a cokehead, all right, big time. And uh, even to this day now, he's been walking with the Lord. He loves Jesus Christ. If he sees powdered sugar, if he comes to my house and my wife is making a cake and there's powdered sugar that's there, he starts to shake. He starts to shake because it reminds him so much of his old life, and he has to leave. He can't stay. He can't even be around it. Now, this is something, this is like, well, let's see, I got saved in 2002, so 2001, so this is 15 years ago. For 15 years, he hasn't done that stuff. And to this day, he still has to, he can't even be around it. Deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. You see, so when we're struggling with something, what's the first thing we need to do? Uh, Not go by that thing, right? Uh, Not participate when others are doing that thing, whatever it is. We already learned, Jesus says, like, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it into the fire. It's better to go into heaven with one hand than to hell with two. I mean, what an enemy we have. What a powerful adversary the devil is. He makes it seem like there's no way out. And he's so smart and crafty and deceiving. And he knows every trick in the book. And he's been around for thousands and thousands of years. He knows humans like the back of his hand. He knows humans. He knows you. He knows exactly what pushes your button. He does. And outside of the saving power of Christ and the the power of the Holy Spirit living in a person, we are absolutely no match for the devil and for demonic activity. No match at all. We're like, the natural man is like putty in the hands of the devil. But he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. If we have Jesus Christ, he's the only one who is stronger than the evil one. And he is infinitely stronger. The the devil is God's devil, said Martin Luther. The devil can't do anything that God does not allow him to do. But he's very, very crafty. He knows humans like the back of his hand, and he hates us. He hates us so much that Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Self-controlled and alert. Alert. What is al- now when you when you hear that word alert, what's the, what do you think of? Like, what does an alert person look like? Does it look like this? Yeah, to be conscious, to be awake, like DEFCON five. You know, <laughs> like we are at full alert. Like my eyes are wide open. I realize I know that I'm no match for the devil in and of myself. I realize that I have an enemy who's prowling around trying to devour me, trying to kill me. Any way he can, he wants to do that. I have to be awake and alert, ready to fight. And we're going to learn how to do that. You know, that's why uh, Satanism and witchcraft are so foolish. And just as an aside, I have to say, um, Satanism, these people who, like, there's congregations now that like do devil worship have you seen it's been on the news and stuff and there's some some high school that because they had a christian group 
like InterVarsity for high school or whatever, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, that some deceived kid started a Satanism group and the group, the school didn't allow that. And so they went to court and the court said, well, if you have a Christian group, you have to have a Satan group. That's so ridiculous. And so now they have like a Satanistic priest come to the church, I mean, to the school and like, like lead the kids in devil stuff. All right, that's real. I'm, I can't even make this stuff up. Like, it's so crazy. Like, let's serve and follow the very one who wants to see us burn forever. That's a great idea. Yeah, exactly. But you can't pray in school, though. You can't do that. And if you bring your Bible to class, they'll give you a detention or suspend you. Give me a break. Give me a break. So foolish. The devil would love nothing more than to destroy your soul and kill you right now. But if you're a Christian, you belong to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. This leads us to the second half of verse 13. Our prayer for God to deliver us from the evil one. The first part is negative. Lead us not into temptation. The second part is positive. Deliver us from evil. Um, We need that. Each one of us do. David calls God his strong deliverer who shields his head in the day of battle. Why does King David use such imagery in referring to God? It's because he realizes that there's a war going on. There's a battle that all of us are in, whether we know it or not. And listen, friends, if the devil doesn't bother you, it's because you're going in his same direction. If you never feel attacked by Satan, if you never feel like, I, Lord, I need your help right now, I am being so attacked. Well, he's not going to attack those who are in his army. He's going to leave you be. We need to know this. There's a real war. And the war is not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle against forces that are invisible, but they're powerful. Indeed, on our own, we're no match for them. Satan and his demons are too strong for us. But that's why Jesus came. All the way back to Genesis 3.15, it was promised that God would send the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. And then in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, we see what Jesus does. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Look at that. I'm just going to read that again. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing. So it's saying that Jesus Christ became flesh and blood because we are flesh and blood. And he purposely allowed himself to be tempted in all ways, just like we are, and yet he's without sin, so that he could enable us to overcome the power of the evil one. So it says, he partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Lifelong slavery to the devil. Listen now, every one of us needs to know this. If you were saved at six years old, then for six years you were in slavery to the devil until the Lord saved you. If you were saved at 25 years old, then for 25 years you were enslaved to the devil. It says lifelong slavery, lifelong. That naturally, when we're born naturally, we're born as subjects of the prince or the power of the air, and it takes being born again to be subjects of the king of kings and lord of lords. You know, as I was reading, I'm going to keep going here. Sometimes when I'm preaching, all these thoughts come into my mind, and I have to say them to you. All right, so here it is. As I was reading that wonderful book by Boston uh, this last week, um, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State, he said something so amazing that I had never seen before. It blew my mind. He said this. He said that circumcised parents 
All right? In other words, in other words, like believing parents, okay? When they have a son, is the son circumcised when he comes out? No, he's uncircumcised when he comes out as a picture of the fact that the new baby is not saved because of a parent's will, all right? Not because of natural descent. He's not saved because of that. He's still uncircumcised. Thankfully, my son was circumcised. <laughs> all right, no, but, but the reality is in his heart, he still needs to be circumcised. My boy does. He's not saved just because I am. He's not saved just because he's church baby. He's going to be church baby, right? All of you are his relatives and his parents and his grandparents and his cousins and aunts and uncles. He's going to be raised here. Lord willing, he'll be raised here in this church. He's going to be church baby. But even being church baby doesn't matter. Even that. Then he'll have all the benefits, see? All the benefits. He'll have, he'll have every chance a person could possibly have growing up, hopefully, in a holy household, in a holy church. But he still needs to be born again. He still needs it. He still needs circumcision of the heart. Because up until now, for the last six and a half weeks, he's been in slavery. He needs Jesus to set him free. Jesus came to deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Lifelong. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Oh, thank God for that. Jesus suffered when he was tempted a lot more than we suffer when we are tempted. Because he went 40 days and 40 nights without eating anything. Have you ever done that before? Oh, snap. Have you ever, have you ever gone 40 days and 40 nights of like, I'm not eating anything. I am fasting. We're going to learn about fasting next week, Lord willing. And he was hungry. What an understatement, Matthew says in Matthew 4. After 40 days of fasting, Jesus was hungry. Yes, yes. Like he could have eaten dirt at that point. And Satan comes, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Oh, what a temptation. That's a stronger temptation than literally anything that any of us in this room will ever be tempted by. Ever, ever. And Jesus overcame. He was suffering. He overcame temptation. Therefore, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus understands what you're going through. He sympathizes with us. 1 John 3, 8 says, Christ came to destroy the devil's work, and that's what was accomplished at the cross. Jesus Christ destroyed the work of the devil. He offers victory and forgiveness of sin to you. See, last week we learned... Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's deliverance from the, the penalty of sin. We have a debt. And now we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's deliverance from the power of sin. The power. He delivers us from the penalty. He delivers us from the power. Psalm 18.2 The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. Do you know what, so why it says the horn of my salvation? See, sometimes we hear these words in the Bible and we kind of blow past them and we don't even think about them at all. Like, Jesus is the horn of my salvation. Okay, let's go on to the next verse. What does it mean? The horn of salvation. I mean, what, what's a horn? Well, for those of you who have ever been on a farm before, you ever seen a bull? What does a bull do with his horns? Pierces with them, right? He destroys. He can use his horns to destroy any kind of enemy that comes after him. He will 
pierced the enemy with his horn. Well, it's no different here. Jesus is the horn of salvation. He pierces through the devil. He is the, the strength of our salvation. Horn is also a picture of strength. That's why in the book of Revelation, when the beast arises, he has ten horns. It means he's very strong. He's able to pierce through his enemies. Well, Jesus is the horn of salvation. He's able to destroy the works of the devil. That's what it means. Well, thank God. He's the only way, actually. So how do we access victory over temptation and sins? Is it enough to just pray, Lord, deliver me. I'll keep on doing what I'm doing until you deliver me. I just want you to deliver me. Uh, we always hear from pastor as he's preaching that uh, salvation is monergistic, that the Lord has to come down and do something. And so, Lord, I'm just going to wait for you to do it. And in the meantime, keep going where I'm going and doing what I'm doing. No. No. All right, I'm going to give you five steps, okay? Five steps now for how to overcome your temptations. Number one, we have to have a prayer life. You have to have a prayer life, you know? In James chapter... For he says, uh, you do not have because you do not ask. See, we don't have deliverance from our temptations because we're not asking for deliverance from them. Now, some of us have asked for deliverance from our temptations, okay? And we're going to get to that in a minute. But, but really, though, we sort of depend on our own strength a lot of the time. It said we have to depend on the Lord. We have to pray for deliverance. We have to remember the cross. We have to remember Jesus. We have to remember that he's with us. How's your prayer life? If you're communing with God, speaking to God, praying to God, God will help you overcome your temptations. Matter of fact, um, there's really never been a time where in the middle of being tempted, in the middle of that, where I've gotten on my knees and said, Lord, I need you now. I'm tempted so much right now. I'm tempted. I feel I'm going to fall right now. I think I'm going to fall, Lord. I need your help. Where then after that, in the middle of that, right after I say that, where then he allows me to fall. I don't think that that's ever happened to me before. If I come before him and humble myself and fall down at his feet and say, Lord, I need you right now, he will answer that prayer. Second, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. See, that's um, Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Um, Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness and all these different things. Now, that was St. Augustine's life verse because this guy, Augustine, you ever heard of Augustine before? Or some call him Augustine, all right? I'm going to say the right way, Augustine, all right? So Augustine was like a real fourth century ladies' man, all right? He loved the ladies. He was uh, very um, misogynistic and chauvinistic and uh, really just lived a, a totally audacious life sexually uh, and, and uh, he was way out there. And, um, and he heard a child singing one day in his backyard. He didn't know who it was because he didn't see any children, but he could hear a child singing, take up and read, take up and read. This like weird song. He'd never heard this song, take up and read. What does that even mean, take up and read? And he took it as a sign from God that he should open up the Bible and actually look at it and read it. I don't know why he thought that, but he took it as this sign. I'm going to open up the Bible. And he opened up the Bible, and he read these words. This is what he opened up to. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And he was pierced to the heart. And he was changed. And he became 
bishop in North Africa. And he wrote this wonderful book called The Confessions. You should pick that book up, Augustine's Confessions. And he became a church father. He was changed by that. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothe yourself. Make Jesus be your everyday garment. Think about Him. Pray to Him. Love Him. Serve Him. How do we do that? How can we put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we know Him through the Word. So you should read your Bible. There's this famous person um, right now that um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding him. Oh, good, I have a lot of time. There's this... uh, Controversy surrounding this guy named Andy Stanley. You ever heard of him before? Raise your hand if you ever heard of Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley is the son of Charles Stanley, sort of a, another famous preacher. And uh, Andy Stanley said in this um, now viral sermon that uh, the Bible is not enough. That, that the problem with Christianity is Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's what he said. Oh, I was so upset about that. Because the only way that we know that Jesus loves us is because the Bible tells me so. That's the only way we know who Jesus is, is through God's Word. And for him to say that we no longer need God's Word, and that God's Word is not sufficient for us, oh, I think that 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 brother has really gone off the rails a bit. Okay, And um, he's wrong about that. We know who God is because of his infallible word. We're going to learn one more thing about his word right at the end of this prayer here. Just a moment. Third, put on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. In um, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. See, the evil one is shooting flaming darts at you, but if you have the shield of faith, you can extinguish those darts. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We should all know Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. Put on those things, the breastplate of righteousness, all those things that Paul talks about. Four, have accountability. Accountability. The Bible tells us to confess our sins to one another. Now, the Catholic Church, I think, went in the wrong direction with that and um, made a, a priest in a confessional booth and you know, well, if you say ten Hail Marys and five Our Fathers, you know, then you can have your sins expunged and all of that. Uh, but, but no, that's not what the Bible's talking about. It's talking about confess your sins to your, to your friends, to those who keep you accountable, to those who want to help you grow in the Lord. You can confess your sins to me, knowing that I don't have the power to do anything about them but pray for you. Only God can do that. Only God can take away your sins. But you can confess them to me. It's good for your soul to confess your sins. I'll keep them a secret. Find an accountability partner that can keep a secret. Find someone who's not going to gossip about you. All right? Because when that happens, when you confess your sins, the struggles that you're dealing with, and you get them out... All right? And then you find out, like, oh, all of a sudden, the whole church knows about it. Then it makes you really not want to do that ever again. Right? So let me just tell you right now, church, don't ever, ever, ever in your life, if you're going to this church, don't ever gossip about somebody else's sins here. Don't ever do that. If you do that, and you're a member here, in love, I'm going to tell you this, you will face church discipline for it. Don't do that. Be an honorable friend. Love your friend. Pray for them. Don't use what they confess to you as an object of gossip and slander and yeah, we got something now. I have the dirt on that person. Don't do that. 
Don't do that. Five, fight the good fight. Know that you're in a battle. Know that you have to fight. Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. All right? We really are in a war. But because of what Christ has done for us, we know that we have the equipping and the ability to overcome and in the end to win. We will win. Listen, the devil does not have the last word. Christ has the last word. Amen. Amen. Now, going to come to the postscript of the Lord's Prayer. Some of you who maybe, I don't know if you didn't grow up in this church, maybe you grew up in, in another church, you might say the Lord's Prayer this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have you ever heard that before? So wait. Wait a second. Look at verse 13. And deliver us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for the... Oh, wait, what? Okay. But where did it go? <laughs> where did it go? This postscript, this doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ed forever and ever. Amen. Hmm. Okay. We don't have that in our, in our modern text of the Bible. Why don't we? Because it's disputed. Because it's disputed. Because the second half of verse 13 in Matthew chapter 6 is disputed by scholars. Ah, now someone might say, what? Does this mean that I can't trust the Bible then? Does that, is that what that means? No. I'm going to tell you something right now. That means you can trust the Bible even more. You can trust it even more because the Bible is a thoroughly honest book, okay? It's not like people are saying like, hey, you know what? That verse is supposed to be there. We're going to try to hide the second half of verse 13 so that nobody knows, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, even though it's in the 1611 King James Version, but it's not in the modern version. Why? Well, some people say, well, the reason why is because the modern versions have been changed, and they're trying to bring you to the devil. And the I saw a tract once. This really terrible tract where it was like um, it showed a picture of the devil or who was supposed to be the devil with a red suit on and a tail shaking hands with the guy who was smiling this really toothy smile holding an NIV it was at a church that Amy and I went to once uh, we, uh, we didn't know that they were there's a church that preached this, KJV onlyism, all right? And, uh, and we go in, and everyone's so friendly. And, uh, and we walked into this church, and we sat down, and, and I noticed, wow, everyone's wearing suits also. Kind of amazing, strange. I wasn't wearing a suit, but they were still really friendly to me. And, uh, and the, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the pastor said, okay, get out your hymn books and go to hymn number 612. And we opened up, or it was probably... Uh, 611, and, and we opened up, and, and it was <laughs> this hymn where we stood up, and we started singing, the King James Version is the only one, <laughs> all right, and I'm like, what kind of crazy church is this, <laughs> all right, oh man, no, no, we got, I don't think we can go to this church anymore, all right, no, I don't think so, I don't think so, so then, okay, so then what's, what's the issue here? Why, why is this the case? And why do I say that we can trust the Bible even more? Okay, because the King James Version, 1611 King James Version, used a, a variant of the text called the Textus Receptus. All right, the received text, which up until that time in 1611 was the best um, manuscript of the Bible that was available, okay? Since that time, archaeologists have found earlier versions from earlier than the Textus Receptus that, uh, and I say versions, like, in other words, copyist versions, okay, that are from, you know, 200, 300 years before the Textus Receptus. And so, uh, when we have a verse like 
um, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that's only a hundred years, say, removed from the original writing, and it doesn't have that postscript on us, for the, on it, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And then we see like 50 different texts where it doesn't have the postscript on it. But then 200 years later, we see, oh, it does have the postscript on it. Well, then we must come to a conclusion that this postscript, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, that that was something which was added on by a scribe, perhaps as a textual note. Like, you know how sometimes you write notes in the column of your Bible in the side? You'll write a note there, and then some other copyist, that guy dies. He writes a note, and he's like, wow, you know what? This really describes what, the, what this prayer is, the Lord's Prayer. Why do we pray, deliver us from evil? Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, Lord. That's why. That's the reason why. Amen? That's totally true. And so he... This is a, a, a possibility. He writes it in the margin of his Bible, you know. And then the guy just has a heart attack and he dies. And then another scribe comes in and he's, you know, uh, this Bible's falling apart because they don't have printing press, okay. And so they start to make the, the transcription and they see, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And they say, wait, is that, in the, I think that's in the text, and they put it in the text. Now, someone might think, oh, pastor, then, how do we know that the whole Bible isn't, isn't full of that? Because we know every single place where that actually happened. We know all the variations. It's very clear, all right? If you look down at many of your Bibles, um, it has footnotes. At the bottom of my Bible right here, it says, um, so, lead us not into, into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Note, or from the evil one. Some manuscripts add, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so it's not like they're trying to hide something. It's not like, wow, you know, the Bible's been changed and we don't know what it, the actual one is. It says right here in the notes, it's a possibility that the second half of one verse in Matthew 6 should have been there. It's a possibility that it shouldn't be there. We're not entirely sure. The reason why the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, the Holman, the reason why it doesn't have it is because in the earliest text that we have available, that second half of verse 13 is not there. Okay? To me, that so adds to the credibility of the Bible because we believe in a book which is open to criticism. We believe in a book which is, we can actually go and see. And do you know how many verses like that there are where there's like some serious, like, I don't know if this is actually in the original. Do you know how many? They couldn't even fill one page. It couldn't even fill one page of the Bible. That's how many verses are in dispute right now, okay? We know there's like 20,000 different manuscript copies, and the variants in all of them couldn't even fill one page. We can trust the Bible. And the fact the Bible is honest about it, the fact that we can see here at the bottom, okay, it's possibility that the second half of verse 13 should be in there, Amen. You know what? I'll leave it to your discretion if you want to pray this prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. All right? But regardless of whether the second half of verse 13 should be in the text or should be in the footnote, it's still there. All right? It's not taken out. It's there. It's just in a footnote or it's in the text. It's true still, isn't it? Even if it's a copyist. Note, it's still true. That's the reason why we pray it. We pray, Lord, deliver us from evil because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we really can pray, deliver us from evil because of who you are. Deliver us, Lord, personally and corporately. Deliver this church. Lord, we each have our own temptations that we really struggle with. So many of us struggle with various things that we've struggled with for many, many years. And our prayer now, Lord, is 
that you would lead us not into temptation, that we would not love our sin, that we would hate our sin, Lord, and that you would deliver us from our sin. Thank you so much that we can trust your word. Thank you that the Bible is an open book, that it's open to all who want to see it. Thank you that you've preserved your word, and we never have to worry. We never have to worry about the truth of it. Because your word stands forever, Lord. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are our good Father, whose name is holy, who is in heaven. Bless us now, Lord. Help us to go out and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to say one last thing about that, which is that um, um, none of those verses that are in dispute, there's one from Acts, I think, there's, there's just a couple, um, none of them have to do with, like, doctrine or, uh, you know, questioning the resurrection or anything like that. None of them have to do with that at all. I mean, if you look at the, the end of the book of Mark, you'll see right at the last chapter of Mark, Mark, Mark 16, you'll see where um, it says there's a possibility that these last few verses aren't in the actual text. Man, I'm so glad that the Bible has that. I'm so glad. Because I know that I'm coming to a book that's not lying to me. All right? I can trust it. I can trust it. And I can trust God. And I can trust that God is a God who preserves his word for us. Praise the Lord.